In today's video, we're back with another collection of awesome command line tools. If you haven't seen my previous CLI tools video, it's linked above. And as with that last video, unless otherwise stated, the tools mentioned can all be installed using your package manager of choice. If you're on the Mac and not using a package manager, I'll put a link in the description to my video about the awesome homebrew package manager. Let's dive straight in. Okay, so we're starting off with RMLint, which is an excellent tool to clean up your file system, remove annoyances like empty files and broken sim links, but primarily to find and remove duplicate files. I recently used RMLint to find and remove about 50 gigabytes of duplicated cruft that had accumulated on my NAS drive, freeing up that space locally and also on my cloud drive where the NAS is backed up to. Using RMLint is super easy. Simply run it from the root of whatever directory tree you want analyzing and leave it to do its thing. I've created a directory here with some duplicates hidden in the subdirectories and simply running RMLint, it will very quickly spot all those duplicates and not just by name, but by actual content. So you can see here that I have a file called one.jpg that's duplicated twice in two different directories, but under a different name. The duplicates haven't been removed yet. Instead, RMLint creates a script that we can run to actually perform the deletion. The files marked with RM in the output will be removed and the files marked with LS will be kept. There's a ton of different ways you can designate which files are the originals and which files are the ones to remove, but I think the easiest way, and the one I use most often, is to designate a particular directory as the one containing the originals. So now if I run rmlint asterisk slash slash pictures, I'm telling rmlint to consider the pictures directory as the original. And now we can see that files in the pictures directory will be kept, and it's the files in the other directories that are marked as duplicates. To actually delete the files, we can run the generated rmlint.sh script, and there's a confirmation prompt here and typing anything in will make the process actually happen. I'll put a link in the description to the RMLint documentation. If you like to keep your files in order, it's worth investing an hour or two to read through the manual to see everything that RMLint can do for you. So next up we have rsync, which is installed by default on Mac and likely on many Linux distros. rsync is a fast file copying tool that can quickly synchronize the contents of two directories, including directories on other machines. So I use rsync in a few different ways. First up, I ingest all my camera media from my SD cards onto my computer using rsync. This has three main benefits. First, it's much more reliable than doing it from the Mac GUI where the spinning wheel of death is not uncommon. Second, it's usually much faster. And third, it's incremental, making it very easy to ingest just what's new on the SD card without any fuss. Running rsync for this purpose is pretty easy. We just run rsync-a with the source directory, which is the directory where the SD card is mounted, followed by the target directory. The dash a flag triggers archive mode, which is typically the mode that you want. This mode copies directories recursively, copies things like timestamps, file permissions, and if you run as the super user, file ownership. My other common use case for rsync is copying files from my NAS. Specifically, I'll back up all of the ingested video files from my laptop to the NAS before I start editing a YouTube video. There are two main approaches to this. You can mount the NAS as a volume on your computer. So here I have my Techcraft NAS mounted as a folder in macOS. I can then use this directory as the target directory in an rsync command, and this is just fine. Another option, if your NAS supports it, and, and mine does, is to send from rsync on the client to rsync on the server. And in place of a directory in the target, I use the hostname of my NAS and the path on that NAS that I want to sync to. When I'm copying a lot of data over the network, I'll also use the dash dash progress flag to get a bit more insight on what's happening. Rsync is an integral part of my workflow and I find it hard to beat for syncing directories both locally and across the network. One limitation of Rsync is that it really only supports local and Rsync targets. You're not able to send files directly to Google Drive or Dropbox, or in my case, to the cloud storage provider that I use, which is Backblaze B2. Thankfully with Rclone, we get an experience that's very similar to Rsync, but that also supports a ton of different cloud storage providers. To start in rclone, you first create a config for each remote destination you want to use. And you can do this by either editing the rclone config file directly or by running rclone config and following the little wizard. I've already set up a B2 test destination, which points to my B2 account. And we can see from the Backblaze console here that I've got an empty bucket. And you can think of a bucket as kind of like a dedicated root directory for cloud storage. So back in the terminal with our clone, I can sync this local directory up to my B2 bucket, effectively giving me a quick and easy backup in the cloud. I don't tend to use our clone as part of my standard backup strategy. For that, I'm using duplicacy. And I've got a dedicated video coming up on that topic soon. So subscribe if that's something that you're interested in. But I do find myself needing to archive files directly to the cloud. And for that, our clone is great. 
Next up, we have NCDU, a terminal-based disk usage analyzer. And with NCDU, you can easily find out where your disk space is being spent and quickly clean it up. When you first launch NCDU, it scans the directory you launched it from along with all subdirectories, and then provides you with a full breakdown of where your storage is being spent, sorted from largest consumer to smallest consumer. And so you can see here that my movies directory is quite large. And if I hit enter, the context switches to just the contents of movies. And now I can see that the cache clip directory is particularly large. I happen to know that this cache directory is in use by my editing software, so I'll just leave it as it is. Coming back up and going into documents, I can keep drilling down into the biggest offenders until I can see that my shooting directory is taking up a significant amount of space. And since I know that I've R-synced the contents of this directory over to my NAS, I can probably clean up a few of the directories that correspond to videos that I've already completed and uploaded. Pressing D with an item selected brings up the delete dialog. And if I select yes, then the item is deleted. I like to use NCDU about once or twice a week just to make sure I'm not leaving obvious junk lying around on my machines. So next up we have BTOP, an excellent terminal-based system monitor. There's a huge selection of terminal system monitors. I think there's TOP, HTOP, Glances, and I'm sure many, many more. And more recently, I've settled on using BTOP as my primary monitor for a few reasons. First, and the most important reason of all, it looks really nice. I mean, just running it in the terminal makes me feel like a pro. Second, like most monitors, it has CPU and memory, but in addition, it also shows disk and network usage. And going back to the first point, I think the UI for these, the network in particular, really helps with the usability. Third, it's super customizable. Any of these panels can be toggled on and off using the numbers in the top left corner. So I can toggle the CPU panel by pressing number one. And notice how this gives more space to the other panels which adapt to use the free screen space. We can toggle through some preset layouts by pressing P. And in particular, I really like this layout showing the network traffic in great detail. I'll often use this to monitor the throughput when I'm syncing a lot of large files with rsync. If you're looking for an elegant way to monitor your system or systems in the terminal, then I can highly recommend trying out BTOP. Last but not least, we have NTFY, which I'm going to pronounce as Notify to save everybody's sanity. With Notify, you can send notifications directly from the terminal. So if I run notify send hello, then up pops a notification with hello in the top corner. My main use case for notify is to signal when a long running job like an rsync copy is finished. And to do this, we can use a nice shell feature to send one notification if the job succeeds and a different notification if the job fails. To see this in action, I'm going to try to remove a file that doesn't exist using rm foo. I'll add to this command double ampersand followed by ntfy send success and then double bar followed by ntfy send failure. The command after the double ampersand, which means and, will run if the first command is successful. And the command after the double bar, which means or, will run if the first command fails. So running this gives us a notification saying failure because we can't delete a file that doesn't exist. But if I now create that file and try to remove the file again, then we get the success notification. Applying this principle, we can run rsync with success and failure notifications attached. Now, when the rsync job finishes, we'll be notified. Of course, this isn't much use if we're not sat at the machine to receive those notifications. Thankfully, Notify has us covered via integration with a variety of push notification services, including the one that I'm using, Pushbullet. So I have the Pushbullet app on my iPhone and I've configured Notify with my Pushbullet user key. Now, when I send a notification, it will appear both in the macOS notification center and in the Pushbullet app on my iPhone. This is super useful for kicking off a long running rsync job, walking away from the machine, but you'll get notified if for some reason it fails and you can come back and restart it. So unfortunately on the Mac, Notify is not available in Homebrew, so you'll have to install it manually. To do this, run pip3 install ntfy in the terminal. After doing this, you'll find that you still can't use ntfy. And the reason for this is that pip, which is a package manager for Python tools, installs programs into a directory that is not on your path, so is not accessible by default. To add this directory to your path, open up the zshrc file that's in your home directory, in your favorite editor, and, and add in these three lines, which will add the correct directory for your Python installation into the path. I've linked to a page on my website where you can copy this snippet so you don't have to worry about transcribing it from the video. Save the changes, then open up a new shell, and now you'll find that Notify is available to use. So there we go, six more awesome command line tools that I think if you're not already using are definitely worth trying out. I picked these six tools in particular because they're an integral part of the workflow I use to ingest my YouTube videos and process them and back them up and so forth. And I'm sure that many people will have similar workflows for which these tools are equally useful. Hope you found this video useful. If so, please hit like, please hit subscribe, maybe hit the bell as well so you don't miss out on any future content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.